with an appropriate license. <laughs> yes? Yeah, I can't hear you, but I've seen my... If, if well, if you no, because you now you're you, yes. I mean, yes, but so I, you can't hear it anymore. Uh, yes, I can't hear myself. So, you, uh, uh, is the speaker is correct? I think it's this, yeah, yeah. Okay, so as, as we said at the start of the course, the uh, now we have a, a PET MR system, we have been doing MR reconstruction and we have been doing PET reconstruction. It would be possibly a good idea to try and do both together, yes? And so to benefit from both systems, not just not just on the, on the application side, but also on the, on the reconstruction side. Uh, so uh, I thought it might be useful to have a, a, a brief recap on notation, which uh, for MR, what Gastel was showing you, he didn't go too much into iterative reconstruction algorithms, but he did say we have a forward model and you can do a least squares type of minimization there. We haven't done that in SURF at the moment, but you could now implement the least squares in, uh, in MR very easily and with a bit more work, you can do compressed sensing as well. Uh, and on PET, we have a similar model now. Uh, I apologize that the notation on this slide is different from what uh, Andrew has been using. So in this slide, the image is written as a lambda and the data as Y, while uh, Andrew had an M for the data and an image was theta. theta. So, you know, different pre Um uh, And there is this penalty term over here. So those you can obviously have a penalty for MR as well. I right? for press sensing you would. Uh, in, uh, you might wonder why are we doing uh, least squares type of optimization in MR and why do we do something complicated in PET? That is because the noise model for MR data is in good approximation model, yes? And so uh, that's why people use MR least squares optimization there. There is a difference that in, in MR the data are complex and in that they are not, but least squares as carry as long as you do complex conjugates and so on, everything's fine. So uh, we can do iterative algorithms in MR, you can do iterative algorithms in PET. Um, so can we use these things somehow together? And uh, traditionally, uh, already for quite a while before we had MR reconstructions, uh, people have done a fair amount of work in trying to use MR information in PET because after all your MR has stunning anatomical contrast if you do the correct sequence. And so our PET images are terribly lousy in resolution, so can we use our MR images to fix the PET? In some sense. Uh, you have to be a bit careful if you do that. So, the, the prior information that Andrew was showing, it just sort of looks like this, where you can have different five functions there, you take differences between neighbors, and then you have some weighting factor and so on. So the obvious thing to do there is to say those weights, I'm now going to choose them based on some MR information that I have. If I have a strong edge in my MR image, it's likely that it's an anatomical edge and therefore that it should also be in the pet bit or in the pet image. Uh, or if you do brain and you, set, you parcelate in many, in 160 different regions and you say each of those have different function, you might want to say, well, I'm going to have an edge, a sharp edge, not smooth over the uh, functional regions in, in my brain, but only smooth within the functional region. So that's a very uh, straightforward idea. How do you do that? Well, there are many, many different ways. Uh, the first thing that people were doing, they said, let's uh, use a segmented MR. Uh, so you have your T1, for instance, or maybe a T1 and a T2, and you, you run free surfer or something like that. And you get, in this case, just three classes out. So gray and white matter and, uh, and uh, cerebral spinal fluids. CSF, 
and then you can use prior information. So for many traces, that makes a lot of sense. You, you, your CSF shouldn't have any tracer, for instance, and the white matter might uh, have very uh, low uh, tracer uptake, or it has to be uniform, and so on. So you can try and put that all in your prior information. That's after all what prior means. Yes. Um, so, um, so the simplest thing you can then do is to say, well, I have my segmentations or parcellations, if you have many more different uh, structures. And you say, well, if I have neighbors that belong to different segmentation classes, I'll put those weights to zero. And that means I won't penalize differences between the different regions. And that means you will allow to have a sharp edge between the two. Yes. Uh, a bit more complicated thing is to say, well, I, I know something about white matter. And so you can say my image value is some gray matter plus some white matter, and maybe plus some CSF. Uh, so you have those fractions. Now the CSF value is zero, so you don't, it doesn't appear in your sum. You say my white matter has to be the same everywhere. My tracer concentration in white matter is the same. And you have this as a model for your data. Uh, you get those fractions from your MR. And once you have that, you can still say, okay, now I want to have smoothness on my uh, gray matter image. But I don't need smoothness anymore on my white matter image because I've fixed it to be the same everywhere. So you stick that into your forward model, you do your, you know, your algorithm, and on you go. And then the type of images that you're getting here, I guess, uh, yeah. So this is the MR that was used for the segmentation. That's your normal OSCM image, maybe. That's an uh, A map of your gray matter concentrations. And that's if you then compute your image values. So clearly, by putting that MR information in there, you suddenly get a very sharp image, which is great if you believe your segmentations and if you believe the prior information that you have. Also, it's, uh, that's always the relevant. What's the form of the markup of prior? Is it the So, well, what they used in this particular case is for the mark of prior, they used that. But then, as opposed to doing it on lambda, they did it on the gray matter values on G. Okay, just a subtraction of the. Uh, so they say in my, my gray matter values have to be roughly this, they have to be smoothly varying over the brain, which is why you see that this gray matter thing is very smooth. Yeah. And, and what are the what kind of uh, other? Uh, oh, there's many, there's many. Uh, so one, so this one says I'll I do the segmentation first, and I know what my brain regions are. Uh, then another version is to say uh, I I don't want to run the segmentation, but I do have my my MR image, and that tells me already something. So. The, the Bauscher prior look, goes and looks at your anatomical image. And it says, uh, in my neighborhood, uh, I'm sorry, wrong direction. Those pairs are the closest to each other. Those are not so close. So that means I'm going to force, I put a prior on my pet data as well. I'm going to impose smoothness on the same pairs as that what they were on the pet data. Right? So you you set all what Bauscher prior does. He says, I find me the, in this case three, but we pick five of the uh, best matching pairs. There you impose smoothness. All the other weight factors you put to zero. You don't have to put them to zero. You could say, well, I put them to a half or something, yes, but. That's the, the main idea. You, you tune your weights on your pet image based on whatever you see on uniformity on the pet, uh, on the MR. Yeah. Does that make sense? And so it does apply to any anatomical region. It does apply to any anatomical region, and it's much easier to do. You don't have to run segmentations and all of that stuff compared to the previous slide. However, the, the disadvantage is that it doesn't mean that if your MR image is uniform, then it's actually going to be functionally uniform. 
Yes, and so by using a segmentation with a parcellation where you say my brain is 160 degrees, you put information on how you know that the brain function is in there. And so, yeah, depending on the tracer, depending on your application, that needs to determine which uh, kind of prior you're going to use. Yes. Okay. Uh, so there are other ways to uh, implement this kind of information. So we, we've talked about the tuning the weights, but you can also say, I'm going to uh, use different basis functions as uh, Andrew mentioned. So one of the approaches is to, to do dictionary learning. I don't know if you've, you've heard about that, but so if you, if you have an image, you can very often decompose it in a very small number of patches that uh, the image values are a linear combination of all those patches. So the question is, where do you get those patches from? Uh, that can depend, but we could get them from MR, for instance, yes, and apply those same patches in fact. Uh, so there's many different variations of this idea around. Uh, another one is to use kernel-based reconstruction. So it's, it's related to the previous one, where you say, if, in this region, my MR image is very uniform. I'm going to use not a single voxel there, but I'm going to use a larger region in my head as the thing that I need to estimate. Uh, and that was the original kernel-based methods. You get those based on uh, machine learning. But then you find that that's maybe a little bit dangerous because the, your MR doesn't tell you everything that there is in that clearly, otherwise we wouldn't need to do that. Uh, but, uh, there might be non-uniformities in the pet that are not in the MR, so you need to uh, try and change your kernels accordingly. You try and put some pet information in there as well, and that's still active research, I believe. But that's the basic idea here. Yes? Uh, so now that we've done this, so we've said MR can help PET. We uh, want to see, could it also go the other way around? Can PET help MR? And then can they maybe help each other in a joint reconstruction? So as opposed to doing an MR reconstruction, stick that information into PET, I'm going to do a PET and MR reconstruction. So I'm going to have an objective function which is the sum of my MR and my PET objective function. I'm going to have the two data sets, the uh, MR data and the PET data, and I'm going to optimize the PET image and the MR image both at the same time. Once you have the concept of an objective function in your mind, it's kind of an obvious thing to do. Uh, now, as it stands, there is no point in doing that because if it's a sum, you can just uh, maximize each of the parts separate independently, yes? It's only going to be useful if you have a term that couples the two. How do you scale the optimize of your functions of the MR as something that scales over a million, many of a million or something, the scales over many of thousands. So whatever you don't get, will never will change. So right, so that, that I, I don't think people generally agree on uh, yet on how you should take, how you should do that. And, and usually what, what people will try and, and do is to do it a bit heuristically and I have a scale factor like really two terms. Yes, yeah, so normal, need to normalize. Right, right. So that they, they all max out at one for example. Right. Now from, from a statistical point of view, you shouldn't have to do that yeah. if you, we, we believe in, we strong belief in Poisson of likelihood, yes. And similarly, the MR people should have uh, a good idea of what the noise is in the data. And they can, because they can do repeated acquisitions and all of that stuff. So you, you can get estimates of standard deviations of your gauges. And once you do that, this is what you should, this is a logarithm of uh, a product of two probabilities, and there is no choice about scale factors. So, if you believe in statistics, this is the there is no choice in scale factor. If you say statistics is great, but it doesn't work, then you don't have to scale factor. 
Yeah. Uh, does that make sense? So now you 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 have a penalty on MR and you have a penalty on the uh, pet data. And now we also add a penalty that combines the two. And one of those penalties, we could use some of the things that we've done before. Yes. We could say this, after all, was a penalty that says my pet image is going to look like this if the MR image looks like that. Now, if you do that in a joint optimization framework, automatically what happens is that your pet image is then going to uh, influence your MR reconstruction as well. Okay. So, what kind of coupling term do we use? Uh, it's early days for that, but uh, there's a few different ideas on that around. So generally, what most I believe most of the research has been working on is to say I I believe in structural similarity. So it's mostly for the brain, uh, and you say those those if if I see folds in my MR image, I believe that it has to be pet as well. Now clearly there is zero reason to use the pet to uh, help. Reconstructing this T1 weighted image because that T1 weighted image is pretty good. But if you would go to very undersampled cases, then it might help. So if you are in dynamic cases or cases where there is strong motion or something and you want to do your MR acquisitions really fast, you have a lot of undersampling, maybe your pet can help. So one of the uh, proposed coupling uh, priors is to do joint total variation. So total variation normally looks like uh, you have the norm and then you do the square. Uh, so now you do joint total variation and you have a sum of the gradients in both your MR and your PET image. Now there is a huge scale factor problem because the MR and the PET image are in very different scales. That's entirely uh, part of the parameters that you have in your prior. There is no statistics that tells you what is the scale of my images. You have to decide how strongly do I weigh my MR versus PET. It's a part of the parameter too. Uh, so this will, will force your edges to be in the same place uh, because what that prior does is if that gradient is zero, it's happy, yes? So if you have in your pet image, if you have a gradient, uh, but you don't have it in the MR, it still is a penalty. So it, it wants to put both of them at the same location in the image. But this prior does only talk about norms of gradient, so it doesn't think about orientation. So people have worked on putting orientation in there, and there is different ways of doing it. Uh, we have worked on parallel level sets, which uh, says I, so the red image might be the MR image and the gray might be a PET. And I, I show both of them at the same time. So they, they have different contours. And if the, uh, the edge, edges have different gradients and therefore the gradients point in different directions, I don't believe this. I do believe them much more if they are in the same direction. They can be opposite because the contrast can flip, but they should be parallel. That's why it's called parallel level sets. And so one, one way to give you a penalty is to say, I use a penalty that is the norm of the gradient times the angle between the two. Uh, that's great. It, it, possibly need some modifications because uh, how do you compute the angle? Well, the, the angle needs the gradients. And once your gradients get very small, that angle is not well defined anymore. So you have to, you have to modify this a little bit to actually make it to work, but that's, that's the idea. Yes, everybody happy? So this also tries to enforce your regions to be flat, but in addition, it tries to make your edges parallel. Uh, there's a, a similar idea, which is, uh, is called the nuclear norm. So what that is doing is uh, I, I compute the determinant of those gradients 
And the nuclear norm tells you something about the rank of that matrix of the determinant. And if that rank is zero, then the rank is zero when your gradients are parallel to each other. And if it's one, it means they are uh, orthogonal to each other, or, or one larger anyway. So you can use this thing as well. This is a bit harder to, to implement because uh, you need to think about nuclear norms and how do you do that efficiently, but the effect of it is more or less the same as the previous uh, penalty. So the effect of that is the same. The advantage, however, of this particular prior is that you, you, this is a rank of a matrix of the two gradients, but you could just as well have more, more images. You could have a PET image, an MRT1, an MRT2, um, MR diffusion weighted, uh, whatever. And you stack them all and you say, I, the lower the rank of all of this is, the better. And so Florian Noll has done that. Uh, this in the meantime, it's been published. And so they have a penalty where they reconstruct all of the MR sequences and the PET at the same time. There's other ways you don't have to do that with the nuclear norm, but this I think is the first time you did this. Ask a question. Does the PET image really look better? <laughs> uh, I thought head person, so I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that is the main that is the main problem. I, I you can tune you can tune these uh, priors to make your pet image look like an MR if you want to. Yes. Obviously, the image contrast will be different, but the edges will be bang in the same place, and it will look like it has stunning resolution. Maybe not such a good idea. Uh, in in these images, actually, if you look at the paper, discovering the difference between the different MR reconstructions is a little bit subtle as well. Yes. So, but yeah, the, the joint priors are going to help in situations where your problem is really ill-conditioned. And so when you have MR data which is really under sampled, having a joint prior makes all of sense. If you have very good MR data, please don't do it. But ideally, your prior takes care of that, and that will do it via the weighting and with the statistical model that you discover that itself. But I mean, PET is supposed to give a totally different type of information well, rather to MR. So I mean, mixing them up, it seems to me quite, quite crazy. <laughs> because you invent things in PET which don't exist and you, you discard things for MR that might be important. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's a philosophical question and it's the one that everybody is being asked when you do uh, anatomical priors into PET and definitely more if you do synergistic reconstruction. Uh, do you believe this image or do you believe that image? And that depends on how much you believe your prior information. And the, the, to me, the danger is to go to a clinician and say, look, how wonderful does my PET image look like? It looks as good as your, as your MR. That information was actually not in the data, yes? We have given it by giving it side information from the MR. Now, if we know that that side information is correct, it's a good thing to do because this image on the right will be more quantitative than the one on the left because the one has partial volume correction problems and all of that stuff. And you can kill that by having your anatomical information. But if that information is incorrect, you would be in trouble. Can I? It's a strong statement to say for certain that both PET and MR are completely different. That's just as an extreme statement as saying they're completely the same. The point is right. we're somewhere right. between those two extremes. Right. For yeah. example, you have this very dark blue area in the white matter, I guess, in the, in the traditional reconstruction, which is probably, as you said, just a partial volume artifact. And, and, I mean, the one on the right makes much more sense that the CSF has very low uptake. Right. So it's actually wrong in the traditional construction. Yeah, you, you know the tracer shouldn't be in CSF if, if not your patient. 
should go for, for that seriously. So uh, yeah, so putting that information in makes it more sense. How do these reconstructions handle uh, abnormal anatomical cases? <clears throat> For example, uh, obviously, if you do this kind of segmentation that you mentioned before with gray and white matter, you go completely wrong if you had a large tumor or people had brain surgery. Yeah. There would be a lot of uh, there would be a lot of special cases where people have a not standard and then right. right. So, uh, well, uh, this is why this kind this field has sort of started in three years ago and we're nowhere really in evaluation does this thing make clinical sense we can design the algorithms you can in half a year or a year's time you will be able to implement it in search but that doesn't mean that you will use it in the clinic. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's a difficult question but in, in some sense I think uh, if you if you go this kind of route and you you have I think the more information you put into this, the happier I would feel. If you say, I, I just give it a T1 image, I, I'd be rather uncomfortable. But if you give it a T1, T2, DWI, whatever, and, and all of that information tells us something about the patient, and it might, in the, in the diffusion-weighted images, the oral tumor should be there as well, yes? And then having that information might help. Now, there's always the question if you're, I mean, you have this, the question with Petamar in general, yes? Uh, people do all these studies where they say, I have a nice correlation between diffusion weighted images and uh, at, well, that's great, but then you don't need to do both, really. <laughs> uh, and so that's a little bit the case here as well. If you have a very nice correlation, these things will work very well, but that's maybe not so very interesting. You have to be careful. And so there's a lot of work to do in, in designing priors that uh, give, give you that information. And I think there's even more work to do in saying, somehow conveying to the, to the people who read these images that say, here I'm really sure that this data is correct. Here I have no clue, really. Uh, because what, what you would have is that if you have a nice anatomical edge in your MR, you will get a very sharp edge in PET, but inside the anatomically uniform region, it will still be low resolution. So the clinician has to understand that, that your resolution is no longer uniform. Uh, okay, so these were some phantom examples that, that show that you do, in extreme cases, you, your PET image can help your MR, and so since, since then we've done some Hamilton data and so on so as well, but other people have moved much further than that, and you will hear more of that from Andrew in a minute. Uh, so we're not the only ones doing that, there's uh, quite a lot of work on uh, multispectral CT, uh, and uh, this is an example, and it so happens that the, these people are using the nuclear norm penalty as well, it's just that we didn't read, read each other's papers. Yes. Uh, so once you say I have joint information between different types of images, then you can apply to lots of different problems. And arguably on multispectral CT, this makes a lot more sense than on PET-MR because the images are supposed to be much more similar. Uh, Okay, this is a, a, one of these multi multi sequence uh, reconstructions. Right. So, uh, what are the drawbacks? Well, there are many. <laughs> uh, we uh, Julian Mathis is, is one of the co eyes in our project. <coughs> And he was making the point at some point uh, in, a, in a previous workshop is that uh, we, we, we give mathematical representations of the objects, we use basis functions, we use prior and so on, and then the question always is which one is the best. So once you, you open the door for priors, there's suddenly an infinite number of them. Yes, and that means you need to make choices. Uh, on the other hand, that door needs to be open because it's no good in closing the door and saying, I don't want to see the problem, the problem is there. 
your your pet data reconstruction and in some cases your MR is ill conditioned, you need to solve that problem somehow. Uh, so you will have parameters to tune and you can say, oh, I design a prior that has only one parameter, but that's great because somebody else will write the same prior with just adding another parameter. It's not because you set that parameter to zero that it is the same. So those are hard questions, I think. Uh, we talked a lot about functional versus anatomical already. The, the big one here probably is movement. You do simultaneous fed MR, but no MR sequence lasts the same amount of time as your pet acquisition does. So you will potentially have movement between the two and then your edges will not be in the same place. And so you really can only do this when you combine motion correction. Uh, and obviously it's harder to do because you need to think now about optimization algorithms that much larger data sets and then need to think harder about how you do these and scale factors and all that stuff. Uh, and you need to have both reconstruction algorithms implementation in one framework and that's why we created SURF to be able to do this. Uh, however, there are uh, a lot of advantages as well. You you can improve your image quality drastically if you have the right prior. Um, this meant it's a, a huge field really for further research. Uh, you we want to understand how we discover correlations, which ones we believe, and how do we exploit that. Uh, because we have many more parameters, suddenly we need to find robust ways to set those parameters for certain applications. And as clearly uh, for the joint optimization, we need to possibly, you can't do MLEM on MR data. I mean, you, you could, but it doesn't make any sense because the MR data is complex or so will follow. Uh, so you, you need to have, uh, understand your optimization problems. And, and then once you have all of that, then you need to see does it actually help your answer your clinical question. Uh, so what uh, the uh, I'm I put these were conclusions from uh, Matthias Erhard, who was doing a PhD on on the joint problem. And at the end of his PhD, he said, "This is too hard a problem. Let me go to the anatomical one from the first few slides back." Because there you say, I have an MR that I trust. Let me see how can I improve my pet. Once you understand that, maybe you then go back to the same So uh, we'll all have fun doing research for the next 10 weeks. Uh, once you've done all this, there's no point in stopping really, because I think there's maybe a, a larger scope in exploiting uh, synergy in dynamic data, and there is uh, dynamic data includes motion. There's a lot of synergy in exploiting motion. Uh, nobody, as far as I know, has really thought about uh, how you find motion from PET and MR data and how do you combine those. Uh, I mean, people have thought about it, but I don't think there's a lot of actual implementations of that yet. And so uh, Richard, is, uh, that's his task for the next three years. He, he will solve all of that. OK, that's, uh, that's it. There's any questions? All right. Good.